Did you enjoy the film? It was interesting, huh? Yeah. Thank you. So um, there was a lot to take in in there, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to give you a lot of opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, I'll just give you a couple of brief updates about some things that have happened since the film ended. As you saw over the course of the film, it, uh, it was filmed mostly in 2013, 2014, and here we are toward the end of 2016, which is kind of an eternity in Bitcoin terms. <laughs> so a lot of stuff has happened. And uh, I'll tell you um, a little bit about some of those things, and then you can ask, ask some questions. Um, so Charlie Shrem did indeed go to jail. Uh, got a two-year jail sentence and then got back out, um, was convicted on some charges of, uh, related to money laundering, because you saw in the film that he um, had a bunch of attorneys working on things around the clock for him. But there were indications um, that there were some suspicious things being done with some of the money that was moving through his site. And, um, and he should have known. <laughs> he should have filed suspicious activity reports. He should have registered, et cetera. Ross Ulbricht, the uh, guy who was running the Silk Road, also went to jail and probably won't get out. Uh, he got two lifetime sentences, um, which he's serving back to back. I'm not sure how that works exactly, but um, <laughs> he's, appealing, <laughs> he's appealing those. Uh, that process will probably continue for some years. But um, the, the judge made it really clear in the sentencing that, um, that this is something that they, they wanted to make an example of Ross Ulbricht and uh, deter others from sort of following him down this dark net path. Um, Vitalik Buterin, the, the guy that uh, you see in the picture here, you saw him interviewed. He was the writer for Bitcoin Magazine that they showed at the um, Libertarian Conference in New Hampshire. Um, Vitalik, at the time in the movie, was, was 19. Uh, he actually spent some time here in Waterloo. He was in the... Um, the computer science program here at the University of Waterloo for about six months, and then dropped out. He won a Teal Award um, and um, used that Teal Award to start a company called Ethereum, which is a competitor, sort of a competitor to, block, uh, to Bitcoin, uses blockchain technology as well, but um, is a platform that is more versatile than the Bitcoin blockchain, and you can do a whole bunch of stuff on it. You can write smart contracts, um, you can do all kinds of things, and just earlier today we had some um, cool demos over at Communitech in Kitchener of some of the technology that's being built on top of the Ethereum platform. Uh, things like stock exchanges without the exchange. Um, lots of decentralized applications that allow people to transact peer-to-peer -peer, um, and exchange value for them. Jen Jennifer Shasky Calvary went to HSBC, so she's no longer working for the government, she's working for the banks, um, helping them do compliance. Um, Eric Voorhees, who was one of the original uh, partners with Charlie Schrem in uh, BitInstant, started a company called Shapeshift, which allows you to um, exchange virtual currencies for one another, Ether for Bitcoin or whatever. Um, and you can do that all without any kind of identity verification at all. You don't need an account. You, uh, you, you, you can just do it completely anonymously. Um, and that is being run not out of, not out of New York, <laughs> but I think out of Switzerland. And um, now the, the latest sort of up and coming thing that's happening fast and furious now are this next generation of cryptocurrencies that are also built on blockchains using similar, um, crypt similar um, consensus mechanisms to Bitcoin and Ethereum, but they are really fully anonymous. They use a type of crypt cryptography called zero knowledge proofs so that not only um, is it the case that the sender and the receiver are just represented by these long strings of letters and numbers, but actually you don't even know what was sent and received. You can't verify that on, in a public transparent way the way you can on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, completely and totally private, um, anonymous blockchains, which pose a lot of questions and problems for regulators, uh, as you can imagine. So um, the one on the left here, Mimblewimble, is one version of doing this. Monero launched uh, earlier this year and went from nothing to um, being worth over $10 um, a couple of months ago. Very strong evidence that that's being used in the successor to the Silk Road, the Silk Road 2. Um, and then this Zcash is the, the hot new development to watch for those of you who want to be um, tuned into this space. It's supposed to launch in a few days here um, toward the end of October. I think the release date is, yeah, October 28th is the target release date there. 
And this uses really, really bleeding edge cryptographic um, technology. It's untested. Some of it's been invented specifically for Zcash. It could completely crash and burn, or it could be um, the next Bitcoin in a big way. So um, I'll stop there, and I will just let you ask questions about policy, law, um, what governments have done with this, what this means for society, whatever um, crosses your mind. And I think, do we have some microphones down here that people are supposed to use? So there's, there's some microphones toward the front if you want to come down. Or you can just shout at me from up there. That's fine, too. Who wants to get us rolling? Yeah, up there. Fork, yeah, hard fork, yeah, right. Thank you for the lights. Um, yeah, so um, Ethereum has had a, been a roller coaster ride, as Bitcoin was in the beginning as well. Um, and Ethereum is a lot newer than Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the white paper was was put out in, in October of 2008, and it launched in 2009. Ethereum didn't start really until 2015. Um, so it's it's a baby still in in the cryptographic space but um, really developing rapidly, much more quickly than Bitcoin did in the beginning. Um, earlier this year, so the event that's being referenced here by the gentleman in the audience, um, there, was a, there was an application that was built on top of the Ethereum platform, which was essentially a, um, a set of smart contracts that allowed people to invest in a fund, a joint fund like a venture capital fund, um, and then so you, you would send in your ether, and in exchange you would get some tokens in this new company, decentralized company. And what you could do with your tokens is you could then vote on proposals that were submitted to the company to develop things on the Ethereum blockchain. And the idea was to sort of democratize angel investing in these early uh, stage startups so that uh, it's not always the, the Winklevoss twins who are making money off the next big tech uh, find, but you and me, we could just put in some money and, and maybe have a chance to get rich. So um, the people who developed this were a couple of German programmers. Uh, through a company called Slocket. And um, you know, when they did it, they thought maybe we'll raise a, maybe a million dollars worth of funds. Um, and it turned out that it went viral, and they raised over $50 million in less than four weeks um, were in Ether contributions. Um, I got a lot of phone calls from, from a lot of regulators saying, how is this possible? Uh, you can't, you, it, why, why are they not registered? Why didn't they register with any securities and exchanges as an unregistered securities offering, essentially? Um, but it, was, uh, there was, it turned out there was a bug in the code, and somebody found it and started hacking the wallet, the online wallet, the contract that held this $50 million, and over the course of a number of hours was able to drain about a third of the value into um, his personal account, <laughs> personal online wallet. So big theft, and what happened was the Ethereum community decided, well, you know what, we're gonna go back and we're gonna, we're gonna change the code to make it so that that never happened. Essentially, we're going to rewrite history. So blockchain stacks transactions in a block on top of one another like this, and they decided that they were going to fork the chain over to this new version of reality over here. And in the new version of the reality, all the transactions to the hacker's wallet were just ignored and created sort of a parallel universe. So we now have Ethereum Classic and Ethereum Core, sort of in side-by-side -side parallel universes. This was a big debate in the community because a lot of people, the true believers in blockchain, said, should, they should be immutable. Code is law. The code is law, and you shouldn't mess with the code. And if somebody uh, developed a, a bad program that they put on top of Ethereum, well, too bad. Um, the hacker has a legitimate gain of you know, the, the third of the $50 million that he was able to drain. Other people said, that's crazy. <laughs> um, code is not law. Law is law. And pretty much any jurisdiction that, that you could research, that, that's, that's true. Um, we have fallback mechanisms in law for when things, unanticipated things happen. Contracts are used in ways that they weren't intended, and usually courts will try and make consumers whole. So um, the Ethereum Foundation developed the code, the miners decided to go with the fork, the vast majority of them, and as a result, the people who had invested in this venture cap fund got their money back. Um, now, I, what I can tell what is my opinion on this? <laughs> what I can tell you is that as a result of taking those actions, uh, a couple of things happened. First of all, 
neither the Ethereum Foundation nor Slocket, the developers who created this organization, have been prosecuted by the authorities in any country that I know. Why? Because everybody was made whole. Um, had they not done that, would they have been prosecuted? Would they be under investigation? Probably super likely, in my opinion. Uh, you don't lose $50 million and, and not attract the, the attention of regulators. Uh, the community, I think, learned a lot of lessons out of this, which is you shouldn't just put to, throw out some, some untested code just because you have a good idea. You need to think through the implications um, and make sure that you have adequate safeguards around what you're doing. Um, but there was a big controversy, and as a result of this, the people who thought, you know, you should never go and rewrite the blockchain, um, ha there, there have been some attacks on the Ethereum as a result, um, and now it has caused them to um, have to address some other concerns in the code that have been spotted. I think in the, in the end, it's probably really healthy uh, for the ecosystem, because um, we don't know who's attacking with these denial of service attacks. We don't know who the, who's, who's been that's been attacking the Ethereum network. But um, better to find out now than later, <laughs> right? So maybe it's a friend of, maybe it's, maybe it's somebody who loves Bitcoin and hates Ethereum, or maybe it's actually somebody who loves Ethereum and wants to see it succeed that's um, causing these, these attacks to take place. But it's definitely improved the code as a result. That was pretty technical. Does anybody else have any other sort of more lay uh, questions or policy questions? Yeah. What is the value of Bitcoin today? The value of Bitcoin today. I didn't, I didn't check today. Last time I checked, it was around 650 US dollars. It's 880 Canadian or something, something like that. Um, sorry? 635 earlier today. 635 earlier today? OK. Yeah, so the guy who was featured in the film, the guy who was making the film. <laughs> um, when, if, you, if you start to type in his name into Google, the first thing that auto-populates into your search field is Dan Ross net worth. <laughs> so I think a lot of people who have seen this film have wondered how much did, did he make from mining in the early days, probably a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so the mint chip experiment, sorry, was there something else? The mint chip, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing an echo of myself, I think. The mint chip experiment was something um, that the Canadian mint started experimenting with before blockchain, before Bitcoin uh, came out, or at least they started doing it before, they, before it was on their radar. Um, so the Canadian bank was looking at um, the possibility of a, of a digital version of the Canadian dollar. Um, but it was not based on blockchain technology, the mint chip experiment. I'm not familiar with the details, um, the project, they, they ran the experiment, um, there were a bunch of non-disclosure agreements with people who were familiar with the experiment and there are not a lot of details that came out of it that were released to the public. Um, but the follow-on to that is that, well, one of the reasons probably that the experiment was discontinued without further follow-up is that Bitcoin and blockchain did come along and it became pretty qu clear pretty quickly that if you were going to digitize uh, the Canadian dollar, you, you might want to think about doing it on a blockchain rather than in the way that the mint chip experiment was doing it. Um, the Canadian, as far as I know, the, the Canadian Central Bank, um, let's see, how should I say this? They're, they're, they're following these developments very closely and they um, are working with other central banks around the world to um, commission research papers and run some small pilot tests and experiments on what would it look like to have a fiat version, a blockchain-based version of the Canadian dollar or the British pound or the euro, the US dollar. All of the major central banks are looking into it. Um, some are more interested in it than others. Um, and that, there are a lot of very difficult policy questions about what happens to your ability to control your monetary supply. Um, and the answer to that really depends on how you set up the blockchain. If it's a private blockchain that the, that the central government controls, or if it's a, a public one that everybody can contribute to, like the open source Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains.
Yeah, not yet. The answer is definitely not yet. And one of the big problems with the blockchain community is lack of diversity still today. Uh, you don't see a lot of women. You don't see a lot of people of color. You don't see a lot of socioeconomic diversity. Um, all, you know, all these people, not only are they white men, they're highly educated, they come from good backgrounds. Um, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem, and it's, it's certainly one that the community is aware of. Um, and there are some initiatives, the, uh, the Digital Currencies Initiative at MIT, which was launched in 2015, I think, maybe, maybe earlier this year, I think it's 2015. They made diversity, diversification of the community one of their big goals and have been focusing on trying to bring, uh, to provide scholarships for women, for people of color, to, to learn the coding, to enter the blockchain space, and also just sort of, sort of distribute um, Bitcoin on college campuses and reach out to diverse communities in different ways. But it's still a problem and uh, it hasn't grown massively amongst um, other seg segments of the population. That said, um, there is a, still a huge potential for financial freedom in blockchain, uh, which I think is only a matter of time until it gets tapped. And one of the big challenges right now is that we have in the world today still about two billion people who don't have bank accounts at all. And the reason they don't have bank accounts is because they don't have identities, official identities. They don't have government ID documents or birth certificates or whatever it is that you need to open up a bank account in lots of countries. Um, and they're too far removed from physical infrastructure to actually do that. Um, Bitcoin, you know, it was described in the film as being able to have a bank in your pocket. And it really can be that. But if you're subject to all these money laundering laws, like the, you know, we saw Jen Jennifer Shasky talking about, and you try and operate some kind of a Bitcoin service that enables the unbanked to interface with Bitcoin, you can't prove their identity. And you could end up in jail because you're transacting with clients who are then using the global financial system without an identity, a verified identity. So there's a big regulatory problem here. And the question is, how do we, how do we solve that problem? We can't give those two billion people birth certificates just you know, as an airdrop. Here you go, here's your birth certificate. Um, but what we can do is we can look at alternative ways of establishing identity. So our existing money laundering regime is built around risk. We're trying to reduce the risk that people are using our monetary system to engage in terrorist financing or drug, uh, drug money, guns, that sort of thing. Um, now, because of big data, we have all kinds of ways of actually triangulating and approximating people's identity. Because a lot of those two billion people who don't have bank accounts and identity documents, they do have phones. And they are interacting very frequently, daily, with um, electronic media. Um, and when you have enough data on people that you can triangulate and analyze with big data analytics, you can verify to a reasonable degree of accuracy, is this a person who um, should be suspicious for a terrorist watch list? Uh, is this someone we, th we think might be engaged in money laundering for other purposes? If we can convince regulators to think about alternative ways of establishing identity that don't rely on social security numbers and birth certificates, then it might be possible to really realize that dream of financial inclusion. Yeah? Do we have any sense where you think the IRS is with the tax audit? You can look at some of these bank structures, anyone in the US. Do we have any sense of where they are looking at some of these Bitcoin? Yeah, so one of the properties of Bitcoin is that it actually, there's, there's, a, there's a public ledger of every transaction that's ever happened on the network. And you can apply data analytics to that and trace money through the system over time. And this is, is being done. There are, data, there are firms that specialize in this now, Chainalysis and others, that look specifically at the Bitcoin blockchain um, and, and parse what they can out of that data. And actually, Char, uh, not Charlie Schrem, but um, Ross Ulbrich, the, the Silk Road guy, was caught partially thanks to these data analysis techniques. So it turns out that Bitcoin itself is not really a very good way to launder money. <laughs> if you want to do that, you're still better off using cash than you are using Bitcoin, which is probably why we haven't really seen um, Bitcoin being used for jihadism, for example. Um, it's just, it's not a very safe way to launder money. Um, and, but these new technologies that I have on the screen here could be really, really good ways to launder money. Uh, because of the new anonymity features. And that makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to do data mining uh, in the way that was done in the, in the Silk Road case. So um, that will make the job of the IRS or whatever revenue authority around the world a lot harder. 
Um, and the question is what kinds of regulatory systems do we build to still accomplish the policy goals? We want to collect taxes because we have to build roads and schools and provide health care and things like that. And we want to make sure the bad people are doing bad things with the global financial system. And how do you do that if you have these kinds of digital systems that are decentralized and now really truly fully anonymous? Uh, those are hard questions. All of the above, yeah. So certainly the, the financial industry is really sitting in the crosshairs, and um, banks are in the crosshairs. It explains why the banks have been some of the first to jump on the bandwagon and try and adopt blockchain technologies themselves. Um, if I can send money across the world in seconds for pennies, why would I go through the banking system? Uh, which takes seven to 10 days and has all these intermediaries sitting in between and everybody takes their cut along the way. I, I do this already with my mom in Colorado. I live in Germany, she lives in Colorado. It's much easier for me to send money back and forth with her using Ether, uh, which takes 17 seconds and costs a couple of pennies than to go through our banking uh, system. But again, we can do that because, because we both have identities and we're tapped into the banking system and I can exchange for euros on one end and she can exchange for dollars on the other. That's not the case for everybody. But for those of us that it works for, it's great. So the banking, the banking industry certainly um, stand, stands in the crosshairs for disruption. Other examples include uh, brokers and exchanges um, for securities, options, derivatives, commodities, all financial products. There's a huge amount of innovation by startups that are basically building software that allows trading to happen uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized fashion on a public blockchain. And then you don't need the NASDAQ. You don't need uh, whatever, you know, insert your, your, your exchange of choice. You can get rid of them entirely. Um, other examples, you mentioned uh, title insurance and land, land titles, titles to cars, intellectual property rights, anything that requires a ledger, a recording of who owns what, that can all be done on blockchains, um, and people are looking very aggressively at how to do that. Lawyers as well, a lot of standard legal services, auditors, accountants, uh, a lot of stuff that can be automated will be automated. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't speak to the Canadian government in terms of administrative burdens. Um, I can tell you that uh, the UK government, for example, has been really on the leading edge of, of adopting and advancing this technology. They are already piloting some really incredible projects. For example, uh, they are distributing in a small pilot project um, social, social insurance payments via a blockchain to a certain um, set of people to test out, is this a more efficient way to get people their money, their social security check, than to go through the banking system. Um, they are piloting, they are looking at um, various options for a blockchain-based br British pound. What would that look like? What would it mean for our control of monetary supply? How many people could interact with it? They're not doing it yet. I'm really careful not to suggest that, you know, that Britain is putting the pound on a blockchain. But they're certainly thinking about it and thinking about what that means, as, as it is the Canadian central government and the US government and many others. Um, what are some other examples? There are a number of governments that are already experimenting with putting their land titles on blockchains and making them publicly accessible via, um, via transparent blockchain that you can, you can pull up from you know, your pajamas at home on a Saturday morning, rather than having to go to the title office and do a title search to see who owns what and if you can buy it and what encumbrances it might be subject to. So there's certainly a lot of, there's a lot of innovation happening and different governments have different pain points. So they're starting in different places. Mm -hmm. Did you say legal or illegal? Legal. Legal, okay. How are they taxed? Let's say a transaction happens in the United States, somebody is in the United States is taxed. Mm -hmm. For which country tax uh, rules apply and what international tax rules apply to Bitcoin? 
Yeah, this is a great question, and it's, important, it's an important example of one way that blockchain could make government services more efficient. So right now, the, the answer is neither of the governments on either end of the transaction knows what has happened until you exchange back out into a fiat currency. So that, that is where you get taxed, at the interface between the digital currency and the fiat currency. Uh, so if I, if I change money, if I change euros for uh, Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin goes up in price, and then I sell Bitcoin for euros a few months later, I get taxed uh, on that as a capital gain, essentially, um, in whatever jurisdiction I'm subject to the taxation laws of, which currently happens to be Germany. Um, it would. Well, you would have to claim it. I mean, you have to, you have to report it is the thing. But because the exchange is regulated, the exchange knows your identity. The exchange also has to report to the revenue authorities all of the activity from the year. And because in order to get an exchange account, you have to sign up with your identity, they will know if you don't report. If you got audited, you could get caught. Um, but, but it's still up to you to report, just like it is to report all of your other income on your taxes when you file your tax return. The problem with the transnational uh, transaction that you gave the example of, though, you know, China versus US, is that there's no geospatial tagging in blockchain. All of these decentralized nodes that are all over the world, it's not like the internet, where you have an IP address that identifies physically where you're sitting. And of course, you can always go on the Tor network and hide your IP address and do other things. Most people don't bother to do that. But in blockchain, it just doesn't exist at all. You have a timestamp, and you have a series of letters and numbers that is associated with your digital wallet. We have no idea where you sit, and there's, there's no way to know on a blockchain. Um, so one of the questions that some governments are looking at is, should we require you to identify your jurisdiction, where you sit, in order to do business on the blockchain for whatever purposes? Because then we can put you into this basket or that pa basket for tax purposes, for money laundering laws, for whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you, you can't manage it if it's a public blockchain like Bitcoin, because Bitcoin, as we saw in the beginning of the movie, was pre-programmed to have a, a hard cap of 21 million Bitcoins that will ever go into circulation. They get released in accordance with the algorithm that was, that was set up in the beginning in blocks of every, approximately every 10 minutes new Bitcoins are generated. Um, the central banks don't have control over that. It's a completely external system. So uh, if more and more people adopt Bitcoin, actual Bitcoin, and it becomes possible to buy more and more things in Bitcoin without ever having to exchange for my government's currency, um, then essentially the government loses control of the money supply uh, because people don't need the government money supply anymore. But governments always have the trump card in the sense that um, you have to pay taxes to your government. And if you cannot pay your taxes in Bitcoin, then you're gonna have to exchange out at some point into the fiat currency in order to pay your taxes. Um, so that's kind of the ultimate uh, trump card, and the taxation power is backed by the, the ability of governments to force you, essentially, to pay taxes, which doesn't exist in the Bitcoin world. Um, but if, if, you, if, you, if you think about, say, you know, uh, Canada adopting a, a, a blockchain-based Canadian dollar, how would they do monetary policy in that world? Well, actually, the central bankers are really excited about the possibility of doing that. Why? Because currently, uh, you know, we've had a whole bunch of time in which central banks have tr experimented with different types of monetary policy. What's the right intervention in a financial crisis? What's the right intervention in a recession that's provoked by an external shock like um, oil prices or, or something like that? Um, and there's a very large and conflicted economics literature on monetary policy and its efficacy. Um, and one of the problems with monetary policy is governments don't have data that's very current. They don't really know what happens to the money that they put out into the banking system because it gets passed through the banks and then kind of grows in accordance with the shadow banking system 
uh, credit and other things that get extended as a result of the money that gets put into the economy. And then it doesn't get taken back into the central bank's control until that actual physical printed money is taken out of circulation again, um, which could be years later. So the data lag is huge, and it's really difficult for central bankers to know what's actually going on with the money that they, that they inject into the economy or take out of the economy. If it's all on a blockchain, then you have real-time data. You see it all happen in real time as the government ad adjusts the money supply on the blockchain. You would see exactly what happens and all of the follow-ons from that really pretty much instantaneously. There's probably more data than you could mine or, or manage effectively, and they would need to develop new data analytics tools to figure out what does all that information mean, but they would have the data, um, and which they don't currently. So central bankers are excited about that as a possibility, and it's one of the reasons that they're looking at it. Would it make for more effective monetary policy? We don't know yet. There's still a lot of arguments on, uh, amongst economists about that. Yes? Yeah, so um, one of the real downsides of Bitcoin in particular is that the way that it secures the network is through this consensus mechanism called proof of work. And essentially what proof of work does is it converts electricity, computer power, hashing power, into Bitcoin. And the more people try and mine and contribute computer resources, the more the difficulty increases of the problems that they're, the cryptographic problems they're trying to solve. And so the, the difficulty just goes up and up and up. That means the energy costs go up and up and up, which is why we've seen this race to develop these incredibly fast processors, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars now to purchase these ASIC uh, chips. So um, it's a big problem. Uh, there, I've seen estimates that the, the cost of the mining verification on the Bitcoin network today is approximately equal to um, the amount of energy that's spent to power the city of Helsinki. Um, so it's a large amount of energy, and it's not very environmentally friendly. Um, so one of the things that's happening in the developer world, for example, um, in Ethereum, is that others are looking at different consensus mechanisms that could be used that would approximate the same level of security that Bitcoin achieves with the proof-of-work model, but do it in a much less energy-intensive way. Um, so there are proposals on the table, there's active research being done, um, proof of stake is a, is a model that's being looked at by Ethereum, and that was their ultimate goal when they launched to move to something called proof of stake, which is much less energy intensive, or could be, but they haven't figured out how to do it yet. It still has glitches, it still has security concerns. We'll see um, if they're able to succeed with that. All right. Well, if there's not, um, if there aren't any more questions, I'll hang around for a few minutes. But on behalf of CG, uh, thanks very much. Sam, did you want to say a closing word or two? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Anisimov. I'm uh, part of the legal team here at CG. Um, CG is a global governance think tank, and we're interested in ways that uh, governments, people, institutions uh, in different countries uh, work together, collaborate on laws and different mechanisms um, to address global governance concerns. Technology continues to challenge uh, the ways we think about some of these things um, because it empowers people, companies, whoever really, to um, have uh, impact across borders almost instantly. Um, and as you can see, uh, much of this is still very difficult to understand because it's so highly technical and it's uh, so very refreshing to um, see people uh, be able to talk about it in a, in a very clear way that's accessible um, to us and to policymakers. And I've seen Julie speak on uh, multiple occasions and it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. So um, if you please join me in thanking her again.